Hey, so today we're going to talk about a verse that many Christians misunderstand or are confused by. That verse is John 10, 34. This comes right in the heat of the Jews trying to stone Jesus and accusing him of blasphemy. And he turns around and quotes Psalm 82, um, which says, you are gods. So we will answer three main questions in the context of John 10, 34. This is not an exhaustive treatment of any of these subjects, but hopefully this will help you to understand the Bible a little more. So question number one, is Jesus God? Question number two, are we gods? And third, why the confusion? So let's get into this. Lord God, Heavenly Father, just pray that you be with me as I um, share from your word. Um, please speak through me and please speak to the people listening. Thank you in your precious and beautiful name. Amen. So let's start off by um, reading this passage from John chapter 10 with a little bit of context. So starting from verse 31, then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, many good works I have shown you from my father. For which of these works do you stone me? The Jews answered him saying, for a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy and because you being a man make yourself God. Verse 34, Jesus answered them, is it not written in your law? I said, you are gods. Verse 35, if he called them gods to whom the word of God came and the scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the father sanctified and sent into the world, you are blaspheming because I said, I am the son of God. So this is quite the verse, um, quite the passage we're looking at here. So a couple of um, things we will be addressing. Um, some people use this verse and say, hey, this means Jesus isn't God any more than you or I are. And thus, you know, use this verse as in denying the divinity of Christ. Um, then there are others who use this verse to exalt humanity to deity, and the two are not mutually exclusive. Uh, so we're going to be looking at these, um, at these ideas and evaluating, are these true? Are these in accordance with the teaching of the Bible? Um, and, you know, my, my thought is clearly it would be easier for God to not have included this in the Bible if there wasn't something he was important he was trying to tell us here. Um, you know, if, if these words are going to be so misconstrued and misunderstood, you know, misunderstood and debated over, then it would be easier for God, in a sense, to not have said it. So um, my, my you know, hypothesis, which we will unpack as we go along, is that there is an important thing that God is trying to um, tell us through these words. Uh, first, let's have a look at the context of the chapter. So if we you know, look up earlier in John chapter 10, um, Jesus is explaining to the crowds that he is the good shepherd that he is the one who takes care of us. Um, and in part of that, in verse 30, um, he says, I and my father are one. And, you know, it's clear from context that he, he is referring to God the Father in this verse. Uh, so the Jews, they understand that this is Jesus making himself to be God. Um, and so they pick up rocks to try and stone him. Um, and now recall that in John 1 verse 12, um, it says, But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name. So the Bible is, is clear that, you know, we are called to be children of God. Um, we are called to be sons and daughters of God. But there's also clearly a distinction between who we are and who Jesus is. Uh, and there are two, two um, passages that I'll turn to here that I believe put these most clearly. In John chapter 1, verses 1 to 3, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. 
So bit of Christology here, bit of um, study on the nature of Christ. All things are made through him. All things. So we cannot turn around and say that Christ is a created being because the Bible says explicitly all things were created through him and without him nothing was made that was made. So we have this statement to stand on, not to mention verse 1 says that you know, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Jesus is God according to John 1.1, 1, 1, very explicitly. But is this God in the same sense as what, you know, um, John 10, 34 is? Well, let's first understand in what sense Jesus is God. So let's look at um, Hebrews chapter 1, and we'll be focusing on verses 8 to 10 here. Um, this is, uh, this whole chapter here, Hebrews 1, is all about, you know, the nature of Jesus versus the nature of angels. Um, they, they, the two are contrasted. So I say, I'll read from verse 7, actually. And of the angels, he says, who makes his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. Verse 8, but to the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. Verse 10, and you, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. Now, who, now, we'll hone in on verse 10 here. We'll come back to the others in a moment, but hone in on verse 10. It says, you, Lord, that's quoting from Psalm in the original, that is Yahweh, the personal name for God, the God, um, and saying, you laid the foundation of the earth, the heavens are the work of your hands. And John 1, 3 said that everything that was made was made through God. Jesus. So this is saying, verse 10 is addressed to, it is saying, you Lord, you Yahweh, our creator. And contextually, it's addressed to the Son. So this is saying, Jesus is Yahweh. That is a, an explicit correlation that's making there. Back up to verses 8 and 9, it says, Your throne, O God, is saying that to the Son. Um, and, and um, you know, then it's saying, Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you. Who was it that anointed Jesus? That would be God the Father. Um, so, you know, therefore, God, your God, this is saying God the Father is still, you know, Jesus's God. That, that God the Father within the context of the Trinity is still of a higher position than Jesus. He says the Father is greater than I am. But they are both persons of the Godhead of the Trinity. They are both Yahweh. So then we come back to John 10, 34. Does this change anything? What Jesus says here does by no means, like, um, restrict or limit the definition of God. If anything, it expands it. And so, um, you know, Jesus saying, you know, you are gods, re regardless of the context or, or who he's saying that to, this is only, you know, the, the only possibility here is this adding other people to possess the title of gods. This does nothing to diminish who Jesus is unless we're looking at the contrast, which we'll get into further along. But this verse cannot be used to say that Jesus is less God than what other verses explicitly state him to be. So we've looked at the question, is Jesus God? The answer is yes, John 10, 34 does not change the answer to that. But now we'll look at the question, are we gods? What what do these um, words, I said you are God, what does that actually mean? So another thing, important context here, Jesus is quoting from Psalm 82. So let's 
read Psalm 82. It's only like seven verses, eight verses. Um, so we can give that a read. This will help us to understand what is and is not being discussed here. God stands in the congregation of the mighty. He judges among the gods. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Defend the poor and fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and needy. Deliver the poor and needy. Free them from the hand of the wicked. For they do not know, nor do they understand. They walk about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are unstable. I said, you are gods and all of you are children of the Most High. But you shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. Arise, O God, judge the earth, for you shall inherit all nations. The context here, God is judging the judges of Israel because they are not defending the poor and fatherless. They are not delivering the poor and needy from the wicked. They are judging unjustly, as verse 2 says. And I can back that up because, you know, it's not just me that says that, but Bible translators also see that this title God means judges. New King James Version, which is what I normally default to um, in both verses 1 and 6 that you know, use this title of gods, lowercase g. Um, a footnote there says judges, Hebrew Elohim, literally mighty ones or gods. Um, and do we see other places in the Bible that use the word, the Hebrew word Elohim to refer to judges? Well, we do. Um, in Exodus 21, verse 6, then his, um, I think I'll read the verse as well, the, the verse before as well. But if the servant plainly says, I love my master, my wife, and my children, I will not go out free. Then his master shall bring him to the judges, Hebrew Elohim. He shall bring him to the door or to the doorpost, and his master shall pierce his ear with an awl, and he shall serve him forever. This was, you know, um, in the Hebrew um, slavery system, different to modern slavery. Um, basically, um, somebody would agree to serve a master for a given period of time. Um, the, the master would provide for them with, you know, food and lodging. Um, and they were bought, like, with the price. You, often they would, you know, be receiving that money to pay off a debt. Not always, but this was the, I, you know, the, the God's plan for this was that this is basically like a lot like an employment contract that involves living in the employer's house and, you know, being part of their household. For, anyway, the, 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 the thing is here when there is a judicial thing where the, the, the slave, the, you know, contractual employee, bond servant, wants to continue working for their master um, beyond the end of their contract, then they are brought to the judges. They are brought to the courts. Um, this is a judicial thing that is happening here. We also see uses of Elohim to refer to judges in Exodus 22, um, in particular verses 8 and 9. Um, i read verses 89. If the thief is not found, then the master of the house shall be brought to the judges to see whether he has put his hand into his neighbor's goods. Verse 9. For any kind of trespass, whether it concerns an ox, a donkey, a sheep, or clothing, or any kind of lost thing, which another claims to be his, the cause of both parties shall come before the judges, and whomever the judges condemn shall pay double to his neighbor. That's four counts now of the Hebrew word Elohim translated as judges. There is plenty of evidence here to, to say that in Psalm 82, the words that Jesus is quoting for, this is not talking about, you know, deities or divine beings. This is talking about judges in the courts. We'll come 
we'll, later on we'll look at why this title is used but that title is used to refer to judges so why does Jesus appeal to this verse in John 10 when the Jews are accusing him of blasphemy I would say it's this way that he is showing to the Jews that by their own reasoning, by their own law, their condemnation of him for blasphemy is unjustified. Because if a judge who does wicked works, as in Psalm 82, one who is going to die like men, one who is going to die for their own iniquity, then why should Jesus, who does good works, be condemned when the title of Elohim is applied to people who are morally much worse than him? He is showing them that, you know, they are okay with this psalm being part of their sacred scripture, which applies Elohim to people much less deserving of the title than Jesus. So we've seen Jesus uses Psalm 82 as an appeal to show the inconsistency of the accusations of the Jews. But then let's also evaluate, is it, you know, biblically accurate to, to say that we are gods and what qualities can be um, ascribed to us? So, you know, are we creator? Are we Yahweh? Are we God in the sense that Jesus is God? That is the crux of the question. Are we God in a meaningful way like Jesus is God? Um, it should be pretty clear that the Bible does not support that we are creator of the universe. We were actually created after everything else was already there. You know, Adam could not wake up and say, oh, you know, look at these trees. Oh, I'm, I made that one. Look, I made that one. No, he, he was made after the trees, after everything else. Only thing that was, you know, that God created after uh, Adam was he created Eve and then he rested and blessed the Sabbath day. We are not creator. We are not Yahweh. So... How, how else can we understand, you know, how does the term gods apply to us? Does it apply to us having, you know, innate divinity, innate divine nature? Well, to address that, we can look at a couple of verses that talk about the nature of man and is the nature of man close to the nature of God or the same or different or a lot different? So one verse we can look at is uh, in 2 Peter verses 3 and 4. Um, I say I'll read from verse 2. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. So the power of God and Jesus has given us all things pertaining to godliness. We don't possess any of them without him giving them to us. Then reading on, through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. We may be partakers of the divine nature through the promises of God, not through something that we naturally possess. If we already had the divine nature, this verse would make no sense because why would we become partakers of the divine nature through God's promises if we already were? So human nature is not the same as divine nature. What can we see about human nature? One great verse to turn to is Jeremiah 17, 9, which says, The heart is deceitful above all things, and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Our heart, our nature, is deceitful and wicked. Uh, Galatians 5, 
um, you know, verse 16 and onwards, um, says, Walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. Um, the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, adultery, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies. The list goes on. The nature of man, our flesh, our, you know, inherent nature is not good. It's quite evil. It is contrary to the spirit. It is contrary to God. James 1, 14 and 15. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own lusts and enticed. Thus, when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. We are tempted by our own desires. We are tempted by something from within us that is ours. Um, and then James 3. Yeah, we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man. Verse 6, and the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature and is set on fire by hell. This tongue that we have, our, our natural state of being, is set on fire by hell. <laughs> we have an evil nature within us not a pure divine nature like God. So in, are we in any sense gods then, in, in the way that anyone really thinks of it? We, are, we do not have divine nature. We are not inherently good, but inherently evil. Yet God's nature, you know, James 1.13 says, God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. 1 John 1, 5 um, says that in God there is no darkness at all. Hebrews 4, 15 says Jesus was tempted in all points as we are, yet without sin. We do not have the character or the nature of God. We are not gods in uh, but in any way in which the sense that Jesus is God. But there are some ways in which we are God. Let's look at Galatians 4.14. Paul is talking about how the Galatians received him when he first came to them to preach um, God's word. Uh, Galatians 4.14 says, And my trial which was in my flesh, you did not despise or reject, but you received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. When Paul was preaching to the Galatians, they received him as Christ Jesus. And as we saw, Jesus is, God is Yahweh. Paul was received in the way that God would be received. Interesting. Exodus 4.16, it's another verse we can look at. This is um, Moses being called by God to, to speak to Pharaoh, to, to call the children of Israel out of Egypt. And Moses is very nervous about his ability to speak. And God eventually capitulates and um, allows Aaron, Moses' brother, to be a spokesperson on his behalf. And in Exodus 4.16, God describes this situation in this way. So he, Aaron, shall be your spokesman to the people, and he himself shall be as a mouth for you, and you shall be to him as God. This was Moses, a prophet of God, being through Aaron to Pharaoh as God. It goes on. 2 Corinthians 3, 1-3. I mean, verse 3 says, Clearly you are an epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but by the Spirit of the living God. We are epistles, we are letters of Christ. He writes, speaks through us, through his Spirit. And don't forget, you know, um, 
that verse in Second Peter. It does say that by the promises of God, we can be partakers of the divine nature. Not that we are inherently that way, but that we can partake of God living in us. And we can, you know, when we minister to people, when we uh, serve God, we can be received as God, as his witnesses, as his ambassadors, as his representatives, like Paul was, like Moses was. So this is not, you know, when, when Jesus says, you are gods, you know, there is no sense in which that applies to all of humanity. And um, even the verse from um, Psalm 82, um, you know, it says, you are gods and children of the most high, but, but you shall die as men. It's, it's contrasting, you know, how they will die with what they were called to. And when we study the concept of being a child of God, it's a calling to be showing the world what God's like, to be his, you know, born again children. And these judges failed to live up to that. They failed to live out a new um, reformed life, a changed life by God. They failed to, to manifest and reveal the spirit of God to the people. And so their status as children of God was withdrawn in a way. That's a topic we can look into sometime. So are we gods? We are not ourselves gods, but we are representatives of God. And there are times where the Bible puts us as his representatives in a very tightly connected way. So then um, my third question that we'll be looking at is why the confusion? Um, I'd say it stems from the fact that the devil prowls around like a roaring lion seeking those whom he might devour. We have an enemy who loves to lead people away from the truth and if he can attack the nature of Christ or the nature of man, it erodes the beautiful truth of the gospel and can be a doorway to the devil leading people astray in all kinds of other ways. Philippians 2 tells us about how Jesus, um, you know, lowered himself, humbled himself to come down from heaven to be like us. This is what Jesus did for us. This is how Jesus saves us. This is the gospel. If Jesus isn't God, then what he did becomes much less. And if we are gods in a you know, meaningful sense of the word, then what Jesus did also becomes much less. The beautiful, profound truth is that Jesus came down from the heights of heaven, down into the miry clay of humanity, in order to raise us up to the heights of heaven. Christ, the righteous one, took on all the temptations that we face, that he can lead unrighteous humanity to righteousness. We can never get our minds fully around how great and wonderful a thing this is. This same Jesus who took lowly, stinky fishermen and used them to build his church is the same Jesus who wants to take us and do amazing and powerful things in us and through us. We need his help oh so desperately and he provides it oh so abundantly. This is what God does. If you haven't experienced the beauty of God's character, then I urge you to seek him with your whole heart. Keep knocking, keep asking, keep seeking for more and more of him. And he promises you will experience a transformed life. May God be with you. Amen.